I'm Carmine Gallo, and today we are going to learn valuable lessons on elevating the customer experience in any company. And who better to teach us than a person whose brand is synonymous with elevated hospitality, great hospitality, and that's Will Widara, who transformed 11 Madison Park into one of the world's best restaurants, I believe, the number one restaurant in the world. Is that correct, Will? That was correct, yeah. Number one, not number three. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> number one. And as an Italian, I believe I'm pronouncing the last name right. I would say Guidara. You're 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 pronouncing it correctly. That's okay, right. Got it. It's it's become like Gadara in this day and age, but that's actually the way to pronounce it. So okay, well. got it. So the new book on reasonable hospitality. Uh, terrific i just i love these kind of books because I, I think they are so valuable for leaders who run customer facing companies in any category but will you have an amazing story you took a middling two star restaurant in new york city i think we can call it middling average maybe above average but within a decade you transformed it into the number one restaurant in the world what is the big picture that applies to anyone in any company? You know, I think perhaps the biggest thing that we did there was the intentional choice to give everyone on our team the permission and the resources to bring their own creativity to the experience such that the people that served our guests were no longer just serving plates of food that someone else had created, but imbuing the experience with their own creativity. Um, there's this quote by US, uh, the retired US Navy officer, David Marquet, that says, the people at the top have all the authority and none of the information. The people on the front line have all the information and none of the authority. We tried to bridge that gap and in doing so took the people that worked with us and turned them from salespeople into product designers. Um, because without exception, people will always bring more of themselves to the work if they have a genuine sense of ownership in deciding what the experience they're serving is going to be. That's excellent. Empowerment, flexibility, uh, helping them reframe what it is that they do day to day. I think those are some valuable lessons. Will, as you know, I write about business storytelling in all of its forms. And I believe that books like yours, Unreasonable Hospitality, teach us something valuable because it shows us that storytelling is not reserved just for a business presentation, a pitch, or a speech. As a leader, you should be creating stories for your customers that they can share through word of mouth with yes. their friends and their peers. This brings us to, I think you know where I'm going with this, the hot dog story. Can you tell me briefly again, the hot dog story for people that haven't heard of it, but why this seemingly minor event completely transformed the way you look at hospitality? Yeah, for sure. And by the way, I agree. I mean, we're in the experience economy right now. And I think people don't collect things anymore. They collect experiences. And we all have an opportunity or perhaps even a responsibility to give people a story that's good enough to help them relive that experience over and over again, such that is one worth collecting in the first place. Um, on a busy lunch service, like well, this is years and years and years ago, kind of middle of the way through our trajectory, I was in the dining room helping out the servers and I was clearing appetizers from a table of four foodies who were on vacation to New York. Um, and they were on their way to the airport to go back home after their meal. And they'd had an amazing trip. They were talking about all the restaurants they'd been to, La Bernadette, Danielle, Momofuku, now 11 Madison Park. But one of them said, uh, you know, the only thing we didn't have was one of the hot dogs from a street cart. And it was like one of those light bulb moments. As calmly as I could, I walked back to the kitchen, literally ran outside of the hot dog cart in front of the restaurant, bought a hot dog, ran back inside. Then came the hard part, convincing the chef to serve it in our fancy fine dining restaurant. But I eventually got him to do it. And we cut the hot dog up into four perfect pieces and added a little swish of ketchup and a swish of mustard and perfectly plated sauerkraut and uh, relish. And before their final savory course, 
which was a honey lavender glazed Muscovy duck, I put down on the table what we in New York call a dirty water dog and explained it to make sure you don't go home with any culinary regrets a New York City hot dog. And they freaked out. I mean, I'd served thousands of dishes over the course of my career. Wagyu beef, lobster, caviar. I'd never seen anyone react like they did to that hot dog. And you're right. It it did change my entire approach to the business from that point forward. I can see people watching and saying to themselves, well, that's great, Carmine. It works for a restaurant. I'm a so- I lead a software company. How does that apply to me? What's the big lesson for us? I mean, there's a few lessons in there, and and I believe they apply to every single industry out there that has any meaningful interaction with people. Um, Athletes always go to the tapes and they've had a bad game to see what they did wrong. They don't often enough go to the tapes and they've had a good game to see what they did well to make sure they keep on doing that thing. When I went to the tapes (laughs) for that hot dog, it was three things. One, it was being present. Um just being so focused on the person you're with that you stop caring about all the things that you need to do. It's only when you're present, can you pick up on the little cues that help you give people the experience that is most appreciated by them Two, And this applies especially to customer service. Take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Far too often, we let these self-imposed standards that come with these perfectly articulated brands get in the way of us giving the people around us the things that will make them the happiest. A hot dog in a four-star restaurant is sacrilegious until you look at the way it made them feel. And third, and by the way, this applies to the people we serve as much as it does the people we work with. In genuine hospitality, one size fits one. Hospitality is about making people feel seen. The best way to do that is not to treat them like a commodity, but a unique individual. And I genuinely believe I could have given that table a bottle of vintage champagne. It would not have had the same impact as the $2 hot dog because it would not have been specific to them. Will, you tried to scale this idea after you had that hot dog experience. Uh, You were the general manager. You're the leader. You're running the team. But how do you scale it to the rest of the team when you're not there? And you came up with what I thought was very innovative. You call this position the dream weaver. Again, I think this applies to everybody. Can you explain what a dream weaver is and how it applies to any other company outside of the restaurant industry? Well, after the hot dog, after identifying the lessons that brought it to life, I turned around and gave permission to the entire team to go out and start doing things like that for their guests on their own without approval to bring themselves to the experience. The thing is, anytime a leader has a great idea, if they're not willing to follow up the idea with the resources required to make it happen consistently, it's nothing more than an idea. It's not a plan. Um, The Dreamweaver was a position we added to the team whose only responsibility was to help everyone else in the team bring their ideas to life. Um, I made it easy for the team to excel in implementing this new plan I had by giving them a person who is wholly dedicated to supporting them and achieving the vision. And with the help of the Dreamweaver, I mean, you talk about stories, the stuff that the team did for our guests was unbelievable. Sleds, a la minute for a table who was seeing snow for the first time, a caviar choo-choo train for a guest who loved Christmas around the holidays, Um, turning our champagne cart into a Budweiser cart for a table who was more Budweiser than champagne. And I think this is the, the thing that was so important about it. Okay, the team was now empowered, but they were also given the gift of giving other people gifts. They were making other people happy. And I don't believe there's anything more energizing than the look on someone else's face when they receive a gift you're responsible for giving them. So many companies right now are struggling with either staying fully staffed or uh, the people that they have there feeling depleted at the end of the day. And their natural reaction is to give people an extra day off. Mm -hmm. I think that's insufficient. If all you're doing is burning out your teams, an extra day off is just giving them a bit more time to re-energize such that they can come in and get burned out again. A culture of hospitality where they're empowered to 
like show genuine graciousness to each other and the people they serve is one of the most beautiful ways to kind of check all of those boxes simultaneously. Will, you're very eloquent when it comes to talking about the customer experience and hospitality. And I appreciate that. What's dawned on me over the last few minutes of this conversation, this isn't expensive to implement. Everything we've talked about is relatively free. Uh, maybe it takes some time or resources to to get your team aligned and empowered, but it's it's relatively free for leaders to do. Why don't more leaders do this? Because let's agree, hospitality and exceptional service on, on, on the level that we're talking about, unreasonable hospitality is not something that is very common in any industry. Restaurants are outside of that category. I think a lot of people struggle with giving up control. It goes back to the authority and information comment I made before. There's there's tension between control and creativity. And the only way to implement the kind of culture that I'm talking about is to lead by trusting your team and recognizing that if you insist on controlling every decision that the organization makes, you're going to hold back their capacity to feel empowered and by definition, their capacity to serve the people that you are in business to serve. You need to respect the fact that they have the information and then turn around and give them some more authority such that they can use that information to the benefit of the company, themselves, and the people you're serving. Excellent. Will, how can business leaders apply the principles of unreasonable hospitality when they work and communicate with teams remotely on remote meetings? Is that something you've been thinking about? I mean, I think it's actually almost essential now. I mean, here, here's the thing. Leaders, for a very long time, the leader in the room just needed to be the person with the confidence and the conviction to say, this is where we're going. And people crave leaderships. So they would follow that person. Then over time, that wasn't enough for a team anymore. They needed to also be inspired to want to go there. The leader needed to have the confidence and conviction, but also the capacity to inspire. Obviously now, easier it, to do in, in person. Easier to do in when, person. When you were, you were running the meetings, you were running the teams. How do we but, apply that to remote work? But no, but here's the thing. What always happened organically, whether around the proverbial water cooler or in the hallways or at the bar after work over happy hour, was the people on your team felt a sense of connection to one another. Hmm. Leaders need to now add a third essential skill, which is to be a host. They need to create the conditions for connections such that the people they work with cease being a collection of individuals and come together as a trusting team, because only then can the collective creative capacity of the team be unlocked. And hospitality is how you create those conditions by whether you're together or not being intentional in pursuit of developing relationships between you and the people you work with and creating conditions where they can develop those same relationships amongst one another. I love this idea of being intentional about uh, creating those relationships. How do we do that remotely? Do you have any specific uh, advice for people? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what we do with my company is yeah. when we start a Zoom, first thing we do is we turn off our emails. We shut down our email windows so that we're actually present with one another. And rather than just jumping right into efficiency, that is the thing. A lot of people do this on Zooms. They get on a Zoom right to work. Efficiency, right. efficiency, efficiency. Forgetting about the fact that when you are in person, it's the time in between meetings that develops the culture. One of the people on my team, her name is Marin. She needs that relational investment as a part of what drives her we all need it. She needs it more acutely. And so we have this thing called a Marin 10. At the beginning of our weekly meetings, we just spend time engaging, learning to trust one another, getting to know one another, investing in the relationships that exist between us. And maybe we lost 10 minutes of our meeting, but the balance of it is much more effective because we took the time to invest in the relationships that support the entire organization. I love that idea. Will, as, as the leader of that remote meeting, can you give me can you bring me into that meeting just for a second? How would you start that meeting? What, what, how would you get into the top, the Marin 10? 
just said, hey, guys, we're going to do a Marin 10. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and, it, and it's a check-in. What you're doing yeah. is you're just giving people the opportunity to check in with one another. Mm-hmm. Vulnerability is an essential thing in service. You can't expect to develop a genuine connection with the people you're serving until they let their guards down. And the best way to invite someone to give a piece of themselves to you is to lead by giving a piece of yourself to them first. Vulnerability is one of the best ways to engage trust. And if you can create a culture where people are inclined to share the good things about their lives, the things they're struggling with, the moment everyone on your team is welcomed to let their guards down, the creative work you can do after that is so much more profound. But whether it's service or leadership, we all need to get into the business of getting people to let their guards down just enough where we can actually genuinely connect. Excellent. Will, thank you for writing Unreasonable Hospitality. Nicely done. I never read anything you know fully through with um or interview an author unless i know that it's valuable for a lot of other people and i don't read any books really that i don't i certainly don't review any that i don't intend to put on my bookshelf as as a permanent resource so i'm so glad that this goes beyond uh restaurants and that applies to restaurants or software companies or leaders and teams on in in any industry so congratulations on it uh, very nicely done and congratulations on all the success you've had i appreciate it I, listen i believe any business can make the choice to be in the hospitality industry and my hope is that when people read this book they'll be inspired to do just that thank you will appreciate Thanks your time you.